Hello, hope you are doing well today. So this past weekend, my daughter had an art and music show at her preschool, and it was the most amazing thing I had ever seen in my life. First, I got to see this incredible self-portrait that she had made at school, which on C is probably better than something I could have ever done. And then she performed a few songs with her class. And it was a really magical experience for me as a new parent. And I share all that just to say thank you to all the teachers and school administrators out there that work hard to provide meaningful experiences for children. You are very much appreciated. I want to thank you to all those who reached out to me last week, sharing where you are watching from. But if this week you are watching and you happen to be a teacher or a school administrator or work with children in any way, please send me an email at jkimatgrace.org. I would love to connect with you and learn more about your life. Um, and please send me an email if you would also like to join a group or receive prayer as well. If you are local to the Boston area, we will be having a worship night in a few weeks here at our Lexington campus. And here's a video from Aaron Martin, our pastor of worship ministry, with a short message. Hi everyone, I am Aaron Martin, the pastor of worship for Grace Chapel and the Wilmington Campus Worship Leader. I want to personally invite you to join us for a very special worship event. We're calling One Church Night of Worship for the World. Revelation 7 says that a great multitude will gather from every nation and tribe and language to worship the Lord. And that is the vision that we have for this night. It will be on Friday, May 19th at 7 p.m. And our cafe will be open at 6 p.m. They'll be serving pizza and the usual cafe drinks and we'll have live entertainment there as well. So we would love for you to come make a night of it. Join us in worship and seeking the Lord together. Lend your voices to the great multitude uh, as we give thanks and praise to our God. So come and join us. I can't wait to see you there. In a few moments, Pastor Tim Galley will give a message in our series titled Revelation for the World. But before we do, let's take a moment to pray together. God, we thank you so much um, for the opportunity to worship together, to be able to hear and learn about how you care so much for us, but for the world, and how you call us, Lord God, to love this world and steward this world well. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would give us the strength and the ability to be able to receive everything you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and open it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. Then I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and read it. But one of the 24 elders said to me, stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Some time ago, I heard that our planet was at risk of solar flares that could create like this geomagnetic energy pulse that would create such havoc on Earth's electric grid system. These solar flares called coronal mass ejections could fry our technology, causing global catastrophe. Now, I'm sure you were just talking the other day about CMEs with your friends, weren't you? There's not much of any way to prevent such a disaster. It's not like we can create a heat shield large enough and hang it in space to protect our planet. We're vulnerable. And then last week, I, I listened to an interview with a cybersecurity expert who said something kind of similar. He said, if a set of EMP bombs were to explode in our country, that is electromagnetic pulse bombs, EMP, they could potentially wipe out our technology in this country for weeks, and that 80% of our national electric grid system would take three to five years to rebuild. Imagine the initial loss of life. Imagine our inability for basic needs. Getting water and food would be dramatically disrupted. Our ability to communicate would be gone. Imagine the anarchy. I mean, you don't even have to imagine this, as there are countless movies that have described all the gory details of what might happen. CMEs, EMPs, the list goes on. Now, I was raised on a diet of peanut butter and jelly, Saturday morning cartoons, and countless doomsday scenarios, including you know, nuclear war and earthquakes and killer bees and various end time predictions that would destroy life as we know it. But man, this is some pretty next level stuff. And today, I'd like to take us to consider all these doomsday scenarios, the solar flares and the MPs and the nuclear bombs and the wars and these natural, natural disasters and alien invaders, that entire genre of movies and documentaries and all that literature on global destruction. Let's take that, and I want to invite you to receive the hope and the joy that can come from the book of Revelation, that there is a God who loves us so much that he gave the world Jesus, and Jesus is at work at redeeming all things. If we see Revelation like that, everything changes. I mean, what if I told you that the focus of the book of Revelation is not about like this doomsday end of the world, but instead the book of Revelation is about Jesus. It's about the revealing the life, the love, the victory of Jesus, and the redemption of all of creation that Jesus is at work doing until its ultimate creation, excuse me, his ultimate completion. Yes, such awful calamities could happen. So let's not be dismissive of that. But let us also not live in fear. Let us instead live with the hope that Jesus will make all things new. And he's building it right now. And we can join him in this redemptive work. The book of Revelation is all over the place. Visions and seven churches and dragons chasing a pregnant woman. The beast the Lamb of Life, 
Jesus with a sword coming out of his mouth and, and about and countless other metaphors and images. And it has this powerful message of ultimate deliverance and hope in Jesus. So in keeping with you know, the style of this book, th- this sermon may also be a little bit all over the place. But don't worry. We'll do our best to keep it on track. But let's have a quick review of the setup of the series that Pastor Brian gave us last week. Our sermon series is called For the Good of the World, which is uh, our series is about the good of the world, which is the second half of our vision statement, discovering life with God for the good of the world. The series itself is called Revelation for the World. And we're looking for, as we were looking for an anchoring biblical text, we realized that the book of Revelation had an extraordinary message, but often misunderstood. An extraordinary message about Jesus and what he has done and what he is doing. So the book of Revelation, oh man, it is classified under the genre of apocalyptic literature. And that is a type of biblical literature that emphasizes the lifting of the veil between heaven and earth and the revelation of God and his plan for the world. Apocalypse is Greek for revelation. It's similar to how science fiction movies work today. You know, Star Wars tells us about the hero's journey a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Star Trek and The Matrix. And, but the one that illustrates my point, I think the easiest, is the movie Avatar. That movie takes place 100 years from now when Earth discovers that there is a planet called Pandora that has resources that humans can use. So they plot to colonize the planet, but this planet is home to the native Navi, an alien species that call that planet home. And so when you're watching a movie about an alternate universe, about space and blue aliens and humanity's ugly side, we may see the sins of colonization and exploitation and murder and outright theft. And we may see a vision of sharing over conquering and loving over destroying. Science fiction. So when it comes to the book of Revelation, it has always helped me to see this as apocalyptic literature, as something similar to science fiction. But be assured, Revelation is from God, and its meaning is true, and it will not fail. Now, that's a long setup for our text. Uh, anyway, we'll be in Revelation 5, but I, I wanted us to have some context as, as we enter into this chapter. So let's receive the reading of Revelation 5 here. We'll go for the first few verses. And it reads, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Just a quick pause here. John is describing a vision, and this is what he sees. The one on the throne is holding a scroll, but the, but the angel is implying that no one can open the seals to the scroll. Now, now, scrolls and seals are like confidential files and encrypted passwords in today's world. Basically, the angel is saying, no one is authorized to open this file. And John knows that the scroll contains the truth of all things. So here he is in this vision, so close to the revelation, but it's locked behind an impenetrable vault. So he weeps. And in the vision, one of the elders says to him, do not weep because, verse 6, Then I saw a lamb looking at, at it as if it had been, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out in all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden 
bowl, a bowl of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. A lot going on there. The first line, the lamb looking as if it had been slain. Over the years, I've, I've joked that, that everyone has a friend like the author in the, of this book, John. This is the same John as the Gospel of John, 1st and 2nd, 3rd John, and, and then this book. And from the help of the commentators, I see John as an artist. And everybody has a friend who is an artist like John. So often when I'm trying to make sense of this book, I, I consider what John might be utilizing in his creative imagination and his, his, his gifts of art to what, what he might be saying to you and to me. Artists, they have their own way of describing things, don't they? And here we can appreciate his great writing that utilizes beautiful imagery that stirs the mind and the soul. And the soul. First, the idea of the lamb. We should recognize the lamb is for sacred sacrifice in the Old Testament. Also a theme that is picked up in the New Testament as well. And this lamb was slain. It continues, it's, this land was surrounded by the elders in worship, and it had seven horns and seven eyes and, and other sevens. Strange. I mean, it's not uncommon for a male lamb to have two horns, but John seems to be saying something else. And so whenever we see seven in the Bible, that usually means complete or perfection. It could be helpful for us to interpret this as the lamb is complete in power, the horns, power and complete in all that he can see and know, the eyes. This lamb, in all the sevens, this lamb is all-powerful and all-knowing. Now we have a sense of, of why this lamb is being worshipped like this. Let, let, let's continue. Verse 9 reads, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood, you purchase for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and, and ten thousands times ten thousand. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. A few things for us to see here. John is describing the risen Jesus. And he wrote about the resurrection in the Gospel of John. And now he's writing in this new genre, this apocalyptic literature. The slain Lamb of God who is Jesus and only He is worthy. And that is significant. Now we might think that John is just a passionate artist and a committed follower of Jesus. And he wants to honor Jesus. And, and that's true and, and good. But also, the, his ancient world was threatening him. They were saying, you have gone too far, John, and you better stop. You see, every time you see the term in the New Testament, Jesus is Lord, or Christ is Lord, we don't bat an eye. But in the ancient world, when you use Lord in the uppercase Lord, in the ultimate sense, uh-oh, heads might be rolling. Literally. In that Roman world, Lord was, Caesar, was Caesar's exclusive title. Caesar was Lord in that world. That's why the early Christians got in, in as much trouble as they did. Yes, they believed that Jesus rose from the dead. And the Romans would have thought that was strange for these odd religious folks who would make such a big deal of this controversial rabbi. And, you know, in their minds, that, that rabbi just went too far. And so they crucified him. But whatever. It went to a whole new level when those believers said, your Roman emperor is not our Lord. Jesus is our Lord. That's not my president. That's not my king. Jesus is my Lord. <laughs> those were fighting words. And Rome fought back with no mercy. 
crucifying believers, beheading, murdering, burning believers at the stake. At the time, the reigning Roman emperor Domitian sentenced John to be thrown in a cauldron of burning oil. He wanted him to suffer. Only somehow John survived. And so they exiled him to the prisoner island of Patmos. Think of it like as, as an ancient Alcatraz. So you can imagine when John gets there, and maybe he's scarred from the boiling oil, or maybe he's been miraculously untouched. There's actually two traditions of history on that story. But one thing is clear, he's not a fan of the emperor. And all those references of the beast, it's probably about him. And a beast is the last one who is worthy to sit on that throne, the one that really matters anyway. And the beast cannot open that sacred sealed scroll. John will say this clearer later, but if I can paraphrase it a little bit, John is saying, forget the beast. The lamb is the one who is only worthy to be worshiped. For those of you taking notes, I wanna share with you three quick takeaways from Revelation 5. And the first point is this, we get to move from lords of war to lamb of life. From lords of war to lamb of life. We don't have Roman Caesars today, but we do, what we do have though is countless wannabe lords. We got a bunch of doomsday Caesars. Some lords just, just want your money. Some just want your attention. Some just want power and a piece of the pie. We might summarize this as the way of the world. And when these folks don't get what they want, they often get violent. They go to war, they, they take it by force, they do what they want to do. I don't just mean global leaders, but that's relevant. I also mean that old human desire to rule over the other, to take what I want. From Cain killing Abel, to Domitian throwing John in the oil, to countless ways that we are capable of hurting and destroying one another today. Look at the way of the lamb instead. Here, the king chose to die and be sacrificed so that all of humanity can be saved and all of creation can be restored. And John is saying, that, that's why he alone is worthy. You can throw me in boiling oil again and I'm not going to change my story. And I'm telling everyone I possibly can about this Lamb of God, the true Lord of all. The first, moment, the first movement here is from lords of war to the Lord of life. The second is this, from fear of death to worship of the giver of life. And that's what's happening in this text. Now this is opposite of how the lords of war and the earthly lords are worshiped. They, they wanna be feared so that people can be controlled. Here in, in John's vision, he's describing a different type of worship. There's joy in this worship. Someone who is worthy of this. And as we, as we read it again and again, you can almost feel the longing that creation is, is waiting for. We have been praying and searching that there would be one who can make all things right. And that's why we sing. And that's why we sing over and over. I'm just going to repeat that one line. Then I heard every creature in heaven and, and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. That's beautiful. You get why there's awe in that. And that feels pretty good for church. But just a small, small quick detour here. When I was a kid, I, I actually used to have a little bit of anxiety from passages like these. Uh, because I was told this is what heaven was going to be like. They told us that in heaven, we'll, we will worship God for all eternity, just like those verses we just read. And as a kid, I, I had this realization, like, I, I can barely get through a worship service. I can't sing these songs forever and ever. I don't want to go to the other place with death and destruction. Well, John's vision here is certainly helpful and powerful. But he writes this not because he's saying this is what heaven is going to be like, but he wants us to make sure that we know that all of creation is going to be praising Jesus, this slain and victorious lamb, the one who conquered death and evil and suffering. 
It's like game seven in NHL hockey, but the inevitability of winning and celebrating, and it's a thousandfold. That's what it feels like. And so when it comes to the idea of heaven, it has helped me to kind of distance myself from this text and letting go of like the pictures of the angels playing harps and, and focusing instead on the idea that heaven is a place where we get to experience the fullness of God and his love and all that he desired that we get to experience that, all of that in his fullness. So maybe like those moments where, where you feel known and joy filled by your creator and redeemer. I also think of those moments with loved ones that you just relish. And there's that thought going in the back of your mind that says, I, I hope I can always hold on to this memory, or I, I wish it could always be this way. Often I think of heaven as that feeling that, that I hope never ends. Not in a Christian Disney sense, but in the full presence of God and all that he is about. Complete love, complete peace, complete justice, complete holiness, and complete joy, complete grace. The third movement is from doomsday scenarios to divine deliverance. I shared in the beginning of this message a, a few of these doomsday scenarios that, that I heard a little bit more recently. The reality is that we're going to hear many, many, many more doomsday scenarios. I know wonderful, interesting folks are going to send me emails saying, you know that the water level is rising and climate change is a... And I know, I know, I know. I'm going to be told about a new epidemic. Science has found a new bacteria. I, I can't wait to all the different doomsday scenarios that you're going to tell me about. Netflix, of course, is going to have a new series of documentaries telling us about all the ways that the world is going to end. And there's always someone like that's being interviewed in those documentaries. That always, this person always says, no one wants to talk about it, but here's the doom. It's a lot. Hang in there. Take it for what it is. And let's not be dismissive. I mean, let's try to be informed. Let us be aware. But, but with all things, instead of giving into fear, may it move us to prayer to God, hope in Jesus, and moving forward in the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I really mean this. Because it, it does damage to us and also to younger generations when we make the story about the doomsday scenarios and, and remove the focus off of Jesus. I keep chuckling at that one line Pastor Brian gave last week when, when he said, some of us were feared into heaven. Huh. I remember a moment when I was a kid and I was caught up in this rapture fever. It was 1988. And in some church circles, there was a popular book at the time that was making the rounds. And it was called 88 Reasons Why Christ is Coming Back in 88. I think we've mentioned it here a time or two. I was a kid in 88, and the only thing worse than the theological premise of this book was the understanding that kids my age were like overhearing and then filling in our own blanks and telling each other, you don't want to get left behind. I don't know what that really is, but it's bad. And I remember being scared and confused. Because I thought the return of Jesus was a good thing, but what I was hearing about was like eminent death and the, all this awfulness that was going to happen to this world. On that particular day when the world was supposed to end, my dad happened to be driving me to school. And in my kid brain, I, I didn't know if that was the last morning that I had with my mother and my sister and my brother, and now these were the last moments with my dad. I was driving into school thinking like Jesus was supposed to re-enter the earth's atmosphere during third period that day. And we talked about it on that short ride to my elementary school. And my, my dad explained that, that Jesus said that no one knows the hour of his return. So there's a good chance that it won't happen today. And then he said, Habibi, which is the term of affection in Arabic for beloved one. Habibi, I'll see you at dinner tonight. Well, the day was kind of a letdown, to be honest with you. Survived the end of the world, but, but I had a lot of homework that night. And I learned a few things. One, that's how you sell books. Man, I'm telling you, if Grace Chapel starts selling 24 reasons why, tw why Jesus is coming back in 24, that's a tell that we're desperate. But two, it was the first time that I began to have suspicion about 
my faith and the people around me? Why was I made to feel so afraid if, if Jesus loved me? And three, why did it seem that pockets of the church were more caught up with doomsday scenarios than the compelling message of Jesus' love and the forgiveness that he invites everybody to? Friends, among our hopes for this sermon series is that we not reduce this book of Revelation to that caricature of scary hellfire and brimstone, but instead it's a revelation proclaiming to the whole world that a better world is possible and that it is here in Jesus. Because of Jesus' work on the cross, we can all experience complete goodness, forgiveness, salvation, and redemption. And that's why this message is good for the world. We're saying it's a revelation of goodness for today. Today in Revelation 5, John is saying, Because the Lamb of Jesus was victorious over death and doom, we can live in the hope of divine deliverance. If you'd like to grow and, and learn more in your understanding of the book of Revelation uh, for, for your spiritual journey of discipleship, I want you to know that we've updated our journey resource library with a few resources. One of, the, one of them is called Revelation for the Rest of Us uh, by one of my favorite authors, Scott McKnight. A few of us are reading that these days. Uh, if you're up for, uh, for a challenge, uh, maybe this book, uh, Four Tastes of the Future by Dean Fleming. It's a resource that our teaching team is using. And if you only have a few minutes and you just want to dip your toes here, I'd like to encourage you to check out the Bible Project videos. Uh, there's two 10-minute videos that, 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 are, that, are, uh, that, are, that they put out. And we have all those links posted here at grace.org forward slash JRL. Friends, there's one more doomsday scenario that, that I want to talk about. And, and that's the one that we, we make up for ourselves. Some of us are not as afraid of you know, nuclear wars go, going on as we are afraid more about our personal doomsday scenarios that, that kind of exist in our minds. How am I going to make it through right now? We're going through some very painful scenarios. Some of us are, are, are going through a health crisis, grief, dramatic conflict with a loved one, financial hardship, and all kinds of personal matters. For me, the comet or the meteor that is hurling towards Earth to wipe us out isn't nearly on my mind as much as living in a society where there are school shootings and countless other acts of gun violence. I want to live aware and sensitive to the numerous types of threats that exist. And I don't want to live in fear. And let us not live with dread or doom. Instead, may you be encouraged by the message throughout Scripture that yes, this truth is cosmic, all of creation, but it's also incredibly personal. The hope of salvation that comes from Jesus, the slain and victorious Lamb, is available for you and for me. Let us not be ruled by the doom that is found in life, but may we live in the present and future hope of Jesus. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful for the gift of your word. We're thankful for this beautiful passage of scripture. And we're thankful for the truth that is contained in it, that you are a God that is victorious. And in Jesus, we can have life. We can experience your love. We can experience forgiveness and salvation. And so may, may you work in us as a church and as us as your followers and as us who are seeking to proclaim this truth to the world around us, that a better and incredible world is available to us now. So may we not be overwhelmed by the bad news and the doomsday scenarios, but may we thrive in the hope that you invite us to. We thank you, Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
One of the ways we remember Jesus, the Savior of the world, is by taking communion together. The scripture tells us on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this blood, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's take a moment together to pause and be in his presence. God, we thank you so much that we 
have opportunities like this to be reminded of who our Savior is in you. I pray that you would allow us to feel your presence in our very lives in this very moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Go in peace.